Well, before that, here on BBC Radio 4, we've the second extract from the memoirs of one of BBC Radio's pioneers, Roger Eckersley. Having worked in virtually every area of broadcasting in the 20s and 30s, including engineering, outside broadcasts, children's programmes, music and entertainment, he was in a unique position to offer glimpses behind the scenes in those early days, especially after the move from the BBC's home for its first ten years, Savoy Hill, to the brand new broadcasting house. James Fleet reads, The BBC and all that. The move from Savoy Hill to Broadcasting House took place in the summer of 1932. I am often asked, what is the BBC like inside? The percentage of listeners who have explored it must be minute, though many must have seen it from the outside, looming up like the prow of a battleship from its vantage point looking down Upper Regent Street towards Oxford Circus. I conducted a number of unofficial tours, taking many friends round who were inclined to treat it as reverentially as a church, speaking in whispers. It is almost with a sense of awe that they gazed at the form of a well-known announcer hurrying along the passage, or looked into the control room with its flickering lights, miles of neatly coiled wiring and agitated needles jumping violently on instruments that looked like clocks. I used to have a special itinerary for these tours. First, up to my room on the fourth floor, facing south, where I could just see the traffic lights at Oxford Circus. Within a stone's throw is the Church of All Souls, Langham Place, with a convenient clock I could see without turning my head. The war has made its changes hereabouts. The windows of the Langham Hotel opposite are bricked up, except for small apertures for air, and behind them sit a large number of BBC staff, some of whose rooms possess a bath in which the old-time clients of the hotel used to take their ease. The church has lost the top of its steeple, and the clock still does not go. After leaving my room, we would take the lift, a modern and golden affair, to the eighth-floor control room, where we would look into the studio in which the dramatic control panel was housed. On the table into which it is built is a stopwatch. An ashtray or two with half-smoked cigarette stubs give a clue to the recent presence of an anxious producer. In brief, the producer sits here, controlling remotely the activities of his cast, his music, his effects. He has perhaps his leading actors in one studio, his supporting cast in another, his music in another, and his effects in the effects room. Telephone lines connect each studio with the panel, and he is listening on earphones. Let us suppose, in the course of the play, a dance is going on. The hero and the heroine are in the ballroom. The butler summons them to say their taxi is waiting. Dance music is coming from Studio A at a steady level. Enter butler from Studio B, superimposed over the music from Studio A. Sound of door shutting from effects room as they leave the ballroom. The producer quickly switches off his dance music with the turn of his studio A knob, and when the front door is opened, brings in and up the noise of a taxi ticking over outside from the effects room. In the meantime, the conversation between our hero and heroine is kept up at a constant level from Studio C. To watch the producer in a complicated piece of work is rather like watching a virtuoso at an organ. It is not for me to know what the future policy will be, but it seems there is likely to be a move towards the American method of the whole production being staged in one large studio. Experience would seem to have shown that there are definite advantages in having matters so arranged that the producer can see, as well as hear, his cast, and it may be that the solution will be on these lines. Whilst on the subject of producers generally... I would like to deny as emphatically as I can the suggestion, which I sometimes hear, that the majority of the people responsible for putting out the programmes are long-haired, aesthetic creatures sheltered by the BBC, living out of touch with the public in a precious, detached world of their own. I find them keen, hard-working, normal individuals with whom I have played golf and tennis, and one of the most brilliant and successful of them all can give me fifty in a hundred at billiards and beat me comfortably. I, who used to think I was not at all bad at the game. I have known individuals take themselves too seriously and regard broadcasting as a cult, but they usually return to earth in due course, and even if they have no sense of humour, their colleagues usually have. Then I would take my party to the third floor, which belonged, in the main, to talks. 
On this floor, too, is the effects room. In this room, you touched a switch and the wind howled. In passing, you accidentally knocked up against a vast sheet of tin, and an angry peal of thunder fills the room. In the far corner, you see a cistern full of water with taps to fill it. It is neatly fitted at the sides with rollocks, and sure enough, there is a paddle suspended on the wall beside it. Turn the tap gently, and you have the trickle of a mountain stream. Drop something heavy into the tank, and you have a realistic impression of attempted suicide by drowning. My personally conducted tour would be extended by quite half an hour if there was a rehearsal or show going on when we came into a studio. If my party were not too exhausted, I would take them finally to the basement to show them a less human, but nevertheless to me fascinating sight. And this was the ventilating plant. With its sideshows of rushing air and water and its multicolored pipes, and so to the cool entrance hall, here hosts of people waited for the lifts or plotted together. Here waited streams of visitors. Here stood commissionaires and, in wartime, police and occasionally even soldiers. Here I have greeted the genial King Hakun, the serious and dignified Queen Wilhelmina, General Sikorsky. General de Gaulle and many other dignitaries. Here too, I would say goodbye to the visitors whom I had shown round the building, and push them protesting into the night, protesting that they had not seen enough. There are incidents I recall in connection with the tenth year of broadcasting. We didn't get an extra week's holiday or anything of that kind, but there was a staff dinner and dance to mark the occasion, at which John Reith. When he got up to speak, received the most affectionate ovation. We also gave a week of special programs to our now five million listeners. It was about this time that wireless exchanges began to grow. They arose to meet the needs of listeners who, for one reason or another, did not want to buy a set, or who happened to live in a poor reception area. The principle of these wireless exchanges is a central reception and distribution point at which programs are picked off the air and sent down telephone wires to the subscribers' loudspeakers. The press were beginning to take more serious notice of us, and in some cases appointed paid critics to write about broadcasting. The BBC used to maintain an aloof attitude to criticism of its works, which criticism was often very unfair, and some heads of departments and producers deprecated the show of dignity and longed to be allowed the chance to pulverise their critics. I think the BBC were right in their policy, as the acrimonious squabbles might have gone on indefinitely. Most of the criticism was destructive rather than constructive and quite unhelpful. So much cancelled itself out. One paper writes of a certain play as of all the clotted nonsense, while another says of the same one of the best plays the BBC has given us. Of another program, very capital entertainment, and again from another, the year's worst broadcast to date. Things are done in a scientific way nowadays with our listener research department, which estimates as accurately as possible the degree of popularity of individual programs, or lack of it. Picking one or two items at random, a running commentary on the Derby attracted thirty two percent of the potential listening audience. Sir William Beveridge on Can Unemployment Be Prevented, thirteen percent; Gracie Fields, twenty seven percent; and the King, sixty four percent. Its findings are of real value to the program builder, but at the same time, the BBC is conscious of a responsibility to lead rather than slavishly follow public taste. In my day, it was far more a matter of hit or miss. Letters from listeners would help us to a certain extent. It is distinctly touching to think of the number of thank you letters we get, when thinking not only of the bother of taking pen to paper, but the finding of the stamp and the posting. Some of the letters we get make amusing reading. Quite recently, we put on a program called Albert Sandler from the Palm Court Hotel, a studio production. And were pleased to find it so realistic when a correspondent wrote and asked us if we would kindly reserve him a double bedroom for the following week. Some of the enquiries we get are rather nebulous, and I saw a letter asking for the name and number of a record which the enquirer thought was Mendelssohn. She fancied it was played at lunchtime, but wasn't sure. She thought it was played the previous Monday, but on the other hand, it might have been last Friday or the week before that, and she wasn't certain if it wasn't a Chopin waltz. After all, 
Would we kindly enlighten another lady as to how to get from Haringey to Hindhead in the most direct and inexpensive way? Another listener told us she had some garments of a rather intimate nature to send to us, which might be useful for national importance. Broadcasting House was officially opened by King George, accompanied by Queen Mary and their entourage, in July 1932. There was much bustle and preparation for days beforehand. I had by myself a new morning coat and trousers, as I was to come with a few others to the tea party. The day before the opening, there was a great rehearsal. The exact route to be taken by their Majesties was carefully traversed, and staff generally regimented as to their exact procedure. On this day, I took the part of the King, and Cecil Graves, the Queen. Sir John Reith, who was to be one of the conducting party, took us round. An unfortunate episode occurred in the first few minutes when one of the staff, who was acting as a kind of black rod and who insisted on walking backwards in a permanent bowing position, fell with some violence into the waiting lift. I too had forcibly to restrain my official superior, but in my temporary capacity inferior, from getting into the lift before me. It was one of the better moments of my life when, as I entered the concert hall, the entire staff rose and sang. God save the king! At me, the great day dawned, sunny and hot. All went like clockwork. After the parade in the concert hall, my control board colleagues and myself slipped up to the council chamber, where we were duly presented. I remember I was enjoying a plateful of strawberries and cream with Lady Minto when Sir John came across, tapped me on the shoulder, and said that the Queen wished to talk to me about the programmes. I was feeling rather shy, but not more so perhaps than the Queen, who must herself have been feeling bewildered and exhausted by the complexities of a long walk round this particularly mazy place. I don't know why I should have been shy, as no one could have been kinder than Queen Mary or more patient with my endeavours to explain things. But I felt I was not being particularly bright, and when, for instance, the Queen told me she didn't like jazz, and didn't I? Perhaps it was unnecessary for me to say that I wrote it. At all events, I, I, I felt that I had not been much of a success, and when I said so afterwards to a friend of mine who had been sitting at the next table, he replied, "Well, I'm not surprised. Why did you persist in calling the Queen, my dear?" During the war, I had responsibility for being chief censor. But censorship has now disappeared, along with the war reporting unit, the names of those reading the news, and towels in the lavatories. It is nice to walk into the BBC and see that the barriers have been taken away, and that it is no longer necessary to fumble for one's pass. It is wonderful to walk out late at night and to look back at the building which still stands grim but scarred in its battle dress, with its flags flying and its windows shining into the night. I listened to a program the other day, which celebrated the fact that the BBC now has over ten million subscribers. It gave me a sense of nostalgia to listen to it and to have brought vividly back to my mind the old days on Savoy Hill, and the start of the shiny new broadcasting house. It reminded me of forgotten programs and forgotten faces, of fogs on the embankment and the clatter of trams, of cold winds sweeping down Portland Place. Of episodes in which I had played a small part, it gave me a sense of pride in having had even a minute share in the building up of this vast concern. I shall be sorry when, in a few days' time, I walk out of it as a member of staff for the last time. James Fleet was reading the BBC and all that by Roger Eckersley, abridged and produced by Neil Cargill, and a peer production.